2024 is a big year. Important elections, the continuation of wars and the risk of more instability. The world is more unpredictable and the tendency is for more disruption. So here are three world threats to look out for in 2024. Number one, the outlaw nations. The invasion of Ukraine has turned Russia into a de facto rogue state. Two years of war with no clear end in sight and Russia keeps piling on the pressure, throwing more bodies and weaponry into the fray. Despite multiple sanction packages, Russia hasn't folded. Putin is now working with two countries no one wants to deal with and that have literally no real friends. North Korea and Iran. Being resource-rich, Russia is able to deflect a lot of the damage from the sanctions packages, selling energy to countries in need, like China, which will gobble up anything resource-related. And now let's turn to North Korea for artillery and ammunition, and Iran for drone technology. This enables and encourages these two countries to evade some of the sanctions applied to them and pursue their rogue politics. All three thrive on disruption, opening the door for instability in other areas. Think of South Korea and Japan from the Korean perspective, and all of the Middle East from the Iranian perspective. Two countries, whose leadership no one really likes, are now empowered by their strategic, economic and military alliance with Russia. They benefit from disorder. It is in their interest, as it is for Russia, to create even more disorder and possibly even promote dissension inside the alliances that oppose them. Iran is the destabilizer in the Middle East, and the more it can benefit from resource purchases from Russia, the stronger Hezbollah will be in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, and the weaker the possibilities of peace that seemed on the horizon by the Abraham Accords will be. Finally, the unpredictability associated with these regimes increases the possibility for events to escalate and take a turn for the worse much more easily. Number 2. Institutional Breakdown we need institutions. With their mission, rules and principles, they are what make it possible to have a civilization. We've built them over time to ensure we can live in peace and prosperity without getting in each other's way while respecting our differences in beliefs, wants and desires. Sadly, we are well into an era of institutional breakdown. Three come to mind. The United States Congress, the European Union, and the United Nations Security Council all face a severe lack of trust. The United States Congress is a good example of how tribal politics take over an institution. This dysfunction is perfectly displayed when an aid package to Ukraine, an external issue, cannot be approved without concessions being made about the southern border crisis, an internal issue. And so, because of a border issue, a country cannot help an ally, Ukraine leaving the other allies, NATO, not knowing what to expect, empowering rogue states and other bad faith actors, Russia, Iran and North Korea, to create chaos and disruption. The EU also faces a crisis of trust. In the minds of many Europeans, EU institutions have become a highly centralized and bureaucratic apparatus, completely removed from the reality of life for the populations. As such, legislation is passed that either doesn't seem to help or actually makes life more difficult, as the farmers' protest shows. Climate policies mixed with environmental regulations are making it impossible for European farmers to make a living and compete with products farmed in Africa or South America, where both labor costs are much lower and environmental regulations are lesser. Not to mention the overwhelming amount of paperwork to fill out. The cracks have been showing over time. The sovereign debt crisis, the migration crisis, which persists to this day, serious concerns about the way the pandemic was dealt with, and now the farmers' protests. Looking to capitalize on this, populist parties on the right are set to win big in the European elections in June. More authoritarian, reactionary, and economically protectionist. Should they win and achieve a large enough representation, we should expect more difficulty in approving legislation and more division. And then we have the United Nations. If an institution specifically designed to prevent war doesn't prevent it, well, what good does it do? What's the point of having a Security Council if peace talks and agreements are negotiated somewhere else and with parties that don't belong to it? 
To make things worse, with an agency whose mission is to provide relief for refugees, UNRWA is accused of having workers that participated in a heinous massacre and terrorist attack. There is not a lot of room for credibility. The UN should be the place where everybody gets together and actually gets something done. Add to this the fact that many countries claim a seat at the table of the Security Council and the credibility and reputation of an institution that is part of the foundation of the modern world and defense of human rights is severely tarnished. Number 3. The Absent and Dysfunctional Superpower The United States has seen better days when it comes to the united part with two parties taken over by tribal politics. This is not the Democratic Party of JFK and this is not the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln. Right now, former President Donald Trump seems to be the most likely winner of the November elections. Assuming he's the winner, let's keep one thing in mind. Trump is not a politician. He's a businessman and a dealmaker. That's how he operates, even in the Oval Office. He has claimed he'd put an end to the war in Ukraine in 24 hours. The question is not if he can strike a deal. He probably can. But it will not be to Ukraine's liking. When dealing as US president, he'll want one of two things. Either an advantageous deal for his country, or a deal that puts an end to something he simply considers a nuisance. The territorial integrity of Ukraine is not a top priority to him, and the deal he'll reach with Putin will test unity among NATO member states. The US is already disengaging as the world's policeman, and for those who think it's a good thing, think again. What if no one else in NATO, perhaps excluding Hungary, wants to accept a deal that ends the war but takes away Ukraine's four eastern oblasts? Does Trump threaten to pull the US from NATO? What if that deal also excludes Ukraine from NATO membership? This peace deal could reshape NATO for the coming decades. In the Middle East, he may be a much closer ally to Prime Minister Netanyahu than Biden, but he'll want to enforce the historic Abraham Accords expect tensions with Iran to increase. We also have the energy issue. During Trump's term as president, the USA became a net energy exporter, something that significantly impacts America's foreign policy and interest in the Middle East. Disruption in maritime trade in the Persian Gulf and the Bab al-Mandeb Strait can be a life or death situation for many nations. One that stands a lot to lose is China, since the Chinese need to import most of their energy and it's a long way between the Persian Gulf and mainland China, with many opportunities for disruption of the flow of commerce. Finally, the no less important question of power transition. At this point, Trump claims political persecution from the Biden administration and Biden fears Trump will take revenge on him by weaponizing the Department of Justice in the event of a Trump win. Both sides seem unwilling to even think they'll lose the election to the other side. All it takes is another claim of election interference and you'll have the world's most powerful superpower paralyzed in an internal struggle between two men who should have retired by now. Russia, Iran and China will be looking to capitalize on it, with the Europeans holding their breaths. If the most powerful nation in the world, responsible for most global maritime trade security and peacekeeping, is absent with internal, violent, and self-destructive behavior, the outcomes are clear. More wars. Multiple locations dealing with famine and energy shortages as they depend almost exclusively on global trade to obtain those resources. And multiple power centers disconnected from each other, looking out for their own interests. <laughs>